Ooh, just checking out my Halloween 3 Season of the Witch NECA selection. They're not in the box there. They're back there on the diorama. God, enough with that music. I love this movie, but enough with the music. Enough with the music. Stop it. Stop it. It's almost time. Stop it. it. The clock is Stop ticking. It. Stop it. Stop it. it. What up guys, Bobo here from Brass Real Brothers. Thanks for joining me for some more hot fresh popcorn. We're hitting the midway point for a Brass Real Halloween. And like I said, I've been having a blast. To kick off this second franchise Friday, we're doing Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. The night no one comes home. Directed by Tommy Lee Wallace and starring the magnificent Tom Adkins. All right, let's get the controversy out of the way. I know what some of you are thinking. Halloween 3, there's no Michael Myers in it. Get it out of here. Get out of right here, man. Shit, you know what I'm saying? So what happened with this movie is, is that from the success of Halloween 1 and 2, John Carpenter didn't direct Halloween 2. He just directed Halloween 1, but he wrote Halloween 2. But it was still a production by him and Deborah Hill. And this one was the same thing, a production by him and Deborah Hill, but they didn't write it at all. This is written and directed by Tommy Lee Wallace. Tommy Lee Wallace did the original It movie in 1990. He did the Fright Night sequel, and he actually worked on the first two Halloween movies. In fact, he was said to be one of the guys who wore the mask one of the times in the original film. But he's been behind the scenes for all the films up to this point, and John Carpenter basically was just like, look, I don't have any interest in doing any more movies. I think it's ran its course. I already kind of felt that way after part one with doing part two, but this one, I really feel like it's done. So why don't we go for an anthology approach? You know, making every movie about a different story from here on out. Well, that didn't work. And that may have worked if there wasn't a Halloween 2 with Michael Myers. Because of that, it just made people mad, pissed everybody off at the time. Over the years and decades, this movie has definitely developed a cult following, a pretty big one in fact. I'm part of that following. But upon its initial release, like I said, people were pissed. <laughs> Get out right, right here, man, shit, you know what I'm saying? They honestly should have just called it Season of the Witch because this is a good movie. It's a lot of fun to watch and it's got a pretty creepy tone to it. John Carpenter also did the music to this, which you can totally tell. So coming off the coattails of Halloween 1 and 2, which were slashers, this one is a slasher, but it's a very different type of slasher. A lot of the kills are off screen or you're seen on screen by them covering it up some way, like with this one, the masks. And there's other types of gore, but it's with robots. Yeah, that's right, there's robots in this movie. So it's starring Tom Atkins, Stacey Nelkin, which I'd never seen her in anything else, and Dan O'Herlihy as Cochran, and Nancy from Halloween 1. She's Annie Brackett, Sheriff Brackett's daughter. She's that annoying one on the phone that won't shut up. Yeah, but I've seen you stuck in plenty of other positions. My parents are gone. Oh, that's fabulous. When did they leave? About a half hour ago. Oh, utterly fantastic. And she's just as annoying in this. Man, I think that like John Carpenter was like, hey, do that same annoying character because I want you to be annoying in this. And they actually kind of focus on it the entire film. Anytime Tom Atkins calls her or is talking to her, she's just annoying. But first time watching this movie, it's definitely meant to make you kind of have that feeling of what's going on. It starts off with this guy running from these people that are following him. And he stumbles upon this gas station with this guy there who ends up taking him to the hospital that Tom Atkins is at, who's a doctor there. So Tom Atkins is just working his regular doctor night shift and he's all chummy with the nurses. That's another thing that's kind of funny. They make Tom Atkins a ladies man in this like all the time. They kind of actually focus on that. Wait, wait, wait. How old are you? <laughs> Anyways, I just think it's funny to make a point to focus on that. Well, the guy who's admitted into the hospital has this mask in his hand and he keeps on saying they're gonna kill us all. And they end up showing the Silver Shamrock commercial on the TV. Oh, that song. Happy, happy Halloween, 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 
They're meant to make you hate that song by the end of this movie. It's supposed to be just like drilling into your head, and it is. By the time the movie's over with, you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, the guy that was admitted to the hospital is to soon be killed by this guy who's just walking real still like. He's in a suit and he's got these gloves on, no personality. And he comes in there and he just crushes his nose bone right there in between the eyes. It's kind of brutal. And once they find out the guy's dead, the dead guy's daughter shows up, who's played by Stacy Nelkin. Because of Tom Atkins and his suspicions, he can't get this murder off his mind because he was killed. They slowly start digging on their own terms and then decide to team up. And, and they go to this old looking abandoned town that has the Silver Shamrock Company there that makes all these Halloween masks. And you get all kinds of foreshadowing in this movie of kids like with the Halloween mask on. And you don't realize it at the time, but like especially if you rewatch it like Sixth Sense or something like that, you catch all these other things that they were hinting at. This doom approaching. But the point is to get into this town and try to figure out what's going on. They pull up into this hotel. As soon as they get a hotel room, Tom Atkins and the girl just start hooking up. Bastard. Like I said, they focus on him being a slime ball for some reason. How old are you? <laughs> but while they're there, they hear this announcement over like a loudspeaker in the town that's telling them that there's a curfew when the sun goes down. Weird. And you see all kinds of similarities to Halloween in this. Like when Cochran's driving his car around town, it reminds you when Michael was driving his car in Halloween 1. And a lot of times you see these guys standing around town watching them from afar that, again, reminds you of Michael in the first one. So they do their best to try to make this film feel associated with that movie in a weird way. They really try to make it feel connected in a cheesy way when Tom Atkins is at this bar and he's watching the TV and the Silver Shamrock commercial comes on. But before he was watching that, they were showing Halloween, the movie. <laughs> The movie is fun and it's way better than people gave it credit for, especially back in the day. If you can just disconnect the name Halloween from it and just think of it as Season of the Witch, it really is a good movie. Especially for 1982, it was good. Actually a little ambitious for the time. But you do have to suspend disbelief. Like as the movie goes on, it sort of starts to get a little wackier and wackier, especially in the third act. One of the wacky things that happens, but it's also a part of the plot explanation, is that while Tom and the girl are doing the nasty next door, the hotel room adjacent to them, this lady looks at one of the silver shamrock emblems that fell off of one of the masks, and she turns it around and she's messing with it, and this laser just shoots her face out. Man, it's wacky, all those bugs and everything. Like I said, at that point, you're just kind of like, that's a brutal kill, but what was that? And then the next day, an ambulance arrives and it says Silver Shamrock on it. And so they're definitely like, all right, something's up. Cochran's there. He's like, she'll be taken to so-and-so with the finest doctors and proctologists. <laughs> what? And you hear one of the guys talking to Cochran and he just says under his breath, he's like, it was a misfire. Misfire? Hmm. Well, Tom Atkins and his girl decide to go visit the factory. And when they get there, there's this other family there with their son. And they end up taking a tour of the place. And you start seeing how the masks are made and all that stuff. But while they're there, they keep noticing some weird stuff, like the, all these dudes just standing around watching them from afar, like Michael. They go back to the hotel and he goes to the front desk to use the phone. And when he gets on there, he hears this recorded message. The lights go out and he realizes Ellie's gone. And that's when you as an audience member realize that this whole movie's been kind of just building in pace and building in pressure and tension the entire time, building momentum. You didn't realize it, but then all of a sudden it pops. The guys in the suits and the gloves start busting through the doors. They've been figured out. The guys are after them now. And like I said, there's nobody around them to really help. So think about it. You're in this town, like back in the 80s, no cell phones, nothing like that. And all of a sudden you're figuring out it's controlled by this one dude that runs a company called Silver Shamrock, but he controls everything, including the ambulances, the time that you're supposed to be indoors at night, and your girl's gone missing. These guys are chasing you. There's nowhere to go or nobody to talk to. You're pretty scary. Finally, he ends up being attacked by one of the guys and kills him, and he realizes they're robots. What the sh**? Yeah, robots made by Cochran. So Tom finally gets captured. All the robots surround him. And once they capture him, Cochran doesn't kill him. Oh, he does the old classic villain thing and explains everything to him. What it is, it's this deadly particle that contains this force that, well, quite frankly, is deadly. Yeah, that's what it is. That's how they explain it. So it starts to get a little wacky, a little off the rails at this point. Then he has Tom Atkins watch this monitor and you realize what that family that was there earlier with the kid, you realize what they're for. And man, it's brutal. Basically all these Halloween masks they make at this factory has a sticker on it that says Silver Shamrock. And on the back of it, it has one of those particles that's deadly. Cochran's trying to kill all the kids. Man, it's really getting out there now. To think part one and two were about a guy stalking a babysitter. 
But that's when you get to see all the bugs and the snakes come out of the mask of the children. Honestly, it's pretty dark. Now that he's got Tom Atkins all tied up, that's when Cochrane gets into the nitty gritty of the plan. It's the Festival of Sauron, an evil witchcraft sacrificial ceremony to kill the children of the world. A little off the rails. But as wild and wacky as this movie starts to get, that kind of adds to the legacy of the cult following of the film and just the weird nature of this movie in general. Just the origin of it, the way it got made, the response to it back in the day, everything. How big it's become. It wouldn't be as fun if it didn't get that wacky, I don't think. But of course, Tom Atkins escaped. One more little cool thing they did, while John Carpenter did the music for everything, there's one scene where Cochran's got him all tied up and he's leaving Tom Atkins in this room and he's, as he's saying Happy Halloween, he's putting on the movie Halloween on the TV to make him watch it while he's got a mask on and they're waiting for that commercial to come on. You get to hear the music to Halloween and it sort of acts like a soundtrack to the movie for a minute. It's kind of cool. Man, but when he finally gets to another phone again to call his wife to tell her what's up, because you realize he's got kids too. You see them in the beginning, and they even mentioned getting masks from Silver Shamrock. So you're like, oh no, he's got to warn his kids. That's just like another thing to layer on top of what he's been dealing with. And he calls his wife, and she's still annoying. She won't listen to anything. Get out of here, man. Shit, you know what I'm saying? You know, she thinks he's cheating on him. She calls him a cheating bastard. Hey, I get it. But there's no reason to bring the kids into things. But it keeps on getting wackier. He ends up killing the robots in this hilarious way. It's just too complicated to describe. <laughs> And that's when it kind of gets a little cheesy and for me because of the way they kill all those robots, it gets a little too seancey at the end and they try to use some effects that don't really hold up too well. I wish they would have made it more like Phantasm 2. Just more graphic and more like physical practical effects and stuff. Like the stinger in this movie where they try to get you after you think the movie's over, the girl that he ended up rescuing from him, they ended up turning her into a robot. She attacks him and she just keeps on coming back and coming back and it's all like practical effects. That I loved. I wish he would have done more of that. But the movie wraps up all nice and tight to where he stumbles upon this gas station, the same one that the guy from the very beginning stumbled on, and the same workers there, and he's trying to use the phone, and that's when you get that cool, you know, stop it! And then it's over. I love it. I think it's a great movie. It's a lot of fun. It definitely has a lot of remnants from the 80s. It's got Tom Atkins in it. I love him and everything. So Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Misunderstood popcorn. Give it a shot. It's a lot of fun. Guys, that'll do it for this episode. Thanks for joining me again. And that hits the halfway marker for <laughs> Tomorrow we're going to be releasing a discussion that Andre and I did, one of our brass rule reviews. We still had some issues with getting that exported the last time, but we got it coming. It's all done and everything. So we got that coming tomorrow. Week three starts on Monday. So make sure you tune in. We're going to kick it off with Planet Terror by the Rebel Director, Robert Rodriguez. Thanks as always, guys. Really appreciate y'all watching. Look for Brass Real Brothers on Facebook. Look for Bobby Williams on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter, Brass Real Bobby at Brass Real. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe button so you can help us get famous. And remember, life gives you lemons, make some bloody popcorn. Hot and fresh, too. Got it!